Hello and welcome to our Early Start um, seminar series. Our focus today is on longitudinal methods. Um, before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that wherever we are, we're meeting on Aboriginal country. And for those of us here at Early Start, uh, we meet on Durrawal land, which stretches from Botany Bay in the south of Sydney, right through to Nowra. We're physically based at the, at the bottom of Mount Kira at, here at UAW, and that has always been a women's area and always known as a place of great learning and knowledge. So we begin our seminar by acknowledging the special place that we meet and, um, and pay our respects to our elders, past, present and emerging. Our session today is focused on longitudinal methods. And the purpose of this series is to focus on research methodologies, specifically in the early childhood context. And we really want to recognise and celebrate the expertise that we have within Early Start, within our ASH faculty at UOW, and the amazing external networks that we have. So our session today, Longitudinal Methods, it's my great pleasure and, and delight to have three amazing presenters for us. And um, I'm going to introduce each of those. And I just wanted to also acknowledge the enormous number of people that are attending the session live today. And um, thanks to those who view the session later on YouTube as well. So our first presenter today is Dr. Ellie Taylor. Ellie is our Translation and Sustainability Coordinator here at Early Start. Ellie has enormous expertise and experience in terms of partnerships between Early Start and community bodies. She completed her PhD in mental health in 2018 and is a real asset to our Early Start team. We also have um, Sally Statton with us from UQ. Um, Sally has experience as an NHMRC Early Career Research Fellow, and uh, she has a lot of expertise in terms of the role of early childhood education and care context for early intervention, and is very experienced with longitudinal studies, um, particularly tracking large child cohorts. And then we have our own Early Start uh, Associate Professor Dylan Cliff, um, who is in the School of Education here in the ASH faculty, is also a Chief Investigator on the Australian Centre for the Digital Child and has ex ex extensive expertise in children's movement behaviours, sedentary behaviour and electronic media use. So what a team we have here today. Um, without any further delay, I'm going to pass over to Ellie, who's doing our first session today. Thank you so much, Lisa. Okay, so I'm gonna start off today by looking at a very brief description of what is a longitudinal study, just to ensure that we're all on the same page. I'm then going to look at our early start discovery space longitudinal study to really set the context for what we're discussing today. And in the context of that, I'll be speaking to some recruitment and ethics considerations that you'd like to consider or you may like to consider with respect to longitudinal methods. So what is longitudinal study? A longitudinal study can be described as an observational study where we're following the same participants repeatedly over a period of time. This could be a shorter period. It could even be the entire lifespan. The UNICEF have a great quote here, which reflects on how we can use longitudinal methods to work with children. So longitudinal studies bring a life course perspective to analysis, and they can contribute to understanding the drivers and determinants of child outcomes. So I'll now speak to our early start discovery space pilot longitudinal study, which was funded by the Abbott Foundation. And this will give us some nice context to, to what we're discussing. The Early Start Discovery Space, for those who aren't familiar, is Early Start's Interactive Children's Museum, which is based here on our campus at the University of Wollongong. And this research has been a really wonderful opportunity to bring together discovery space researchers um, or researchers more generally with the discovery space education team. Our overarching aims for this study were to examine the changes in the five C's, which you can see there as creativity, collaboration, 
confidence, can-do attitude and curiosity, as well as self-regulation in children over a 12-month period. Uh, due to COVID, this did end up getting extended to an 18-month period as the space was, of course, closed for a lengthy period with lockdowns. The Early Start Discovery Space Longitudinal Study has been a great opportunity in a number of ways. It's helped us to quantify the changes seen in the five Cs in a cohort of children who visit the Early Start Discovery Space over a particular period. It's also helped us define more clearly what the five Cs look like in the context of the Early Start Discovery Space. And it's helped us to determine what the five Cs sorry, whether the five Cs are mediated by the number of times a child visits the early start discovery space. And finally, it has helped us to understand the influence of the experiences, uh, which is what we refer to as the exhibits here at the early start discovery space. So do they have an imp impact on that cohort over a period of time? So here are our research questions. We asked what changes are seen in the five Cs among the group of children who visit the early start discovery space over that 18 month period. And as well, what are the changes that are seen in the five Cs as mediated by the number of times a child visits the early start discovery space? So here you'll see a summary of our study design and, and what this longitudinal study looked like. Participants were invited to book an initial baseline testing session and this was at a time that suited them. Initially, sessions did include about three to five children who were doing their assessments. Some were group tasks, some were individual tasks, um, and the sessions took about one hour. Of course, we did have short breaks for the children in between each of the sessions as well. At 18 month follow-up due to COVID, we did reduce that to two children plus their caregivers at each session, just to minimize any risk of transmission there. For each child, the five Cs were then assessed at each visit to determine how each of these change over time for each child, taking into consideration how often the child attended the early start discovery space during that time frame. Each measure for the pilot study was carefully selected, so we assessed one or more of the five Cs as well as self-regulation, which is an important ability that underpins all of the five Cs. You can see at the bottom there, we also included a parent questionnaire across the span of the study. And this was purpose designed to help us understand what the children did within the discovery space, what their home environment entailed, any extracurricular activities that they were undertaking. And at 18 month follow-up, we also asked them about any disruptions to their usual play or their usual activities as a result of the pandemic. At 18 month follow-up, after COVID hit, we also integrated some interviews with a select sample of parents. So we looked to explore parents' perceptions of the discovery space and any of the online content that the discovery space team implemented during the pandemic. You'll also note there in the middle, we did have some nested experiments which were integrated into the overarching study and were funded by the Harvard Center for the Developing Child. Um, I won't speak to that one today, but that was also led by a team here at early start and, and with some partners as well. And that one explored very much um, guided versus unguided play within the discovery space. So it, it nested nicely within this overarching study. The pilot study recruited 129 children aged three to four years. Participants were all early start discovery space members and they were invited to participate in various assessments, as I mentioned at baseline, at six month follow-up and at 18 month follow-up. Of the original 129, we had 95 children attend all three sessions. And for those who didn't attend at follow-up, whether that was either six month follow-up, 18 month follow-up or both, reasons were that the child may have started kindergarten, so they didn't have as much availability. The family could have moved out of area, so it was much harder for them to come in for a session. Um, parents were now working, so they weren't able to come in at a time that suited them. And a few of them simply didn't respond to the invite. So we, we weren't able to catch them via phone or via email. At 18 month follow-up, as I mentioned, only two children and their parent or caregiver attended each session. This meant there was a lengthier process of data collection due to COVID restrictions. However, retaining this amount of children, particularly with the, the pandemic and associated lockdowns in the middle, 
um, was encouraging. It demonstrated that there, there is an ability to recruit a child sample and to retain them over a period of time. So now that we have set the context and sort of set the scene there for a longitudinal study, I'll speak to some recruitment issues. So of course, recruitment for a longitudinal study focuses, focusing on young children, it can be challenging, it can be time consuming. There's, there's a significant um, commitment for a child and a, and a parent as well as family members who sign up to a longitudinal study. For the discovery space longitudinal study, this was an 18 month commitment and the children were approximately three years old when they first began the study. So ideally you really want the child and, and the parents and caregivers to be engaged and interested in the research and, and committed to continuing with it. There are of course many ways to recruit for a longitudinal study and I've listed a few here. Media, for example, social media is proving a really great way to reach out to families, um, advertisements in newsletters and magazines can also be beneficial as well. Going via schools can be helpful when we, we link in with early childhood education and care facilities, as well as going through health professionals. So linking in with local doctors and other health professionals who work with young children and families. Of course, community outreach is a great way to do it as well. So you might have posters in facilities that are regularly frequented by parents and young children. For the Discovery Space Longitudinal Study, we, we sent an email out to all existing Discovery Space members. So we had a really um, defined and, and sort of committed sample that we were able to reach out to, which was the benefit of, of that. We did send follow-up emails over approximately a three month period. And we also had some posters in the space too. So as people went through, they were able to, to look at those and, and sort of understand the benefits of looking at the five Cs in the, in the context of the discovery space. This was in the end quite a fruitful method and we, and we had an engaged audience. So we were able to meet recruitment numbers within that initial three month period. Of course, consideration also needs to be given to the cost effectiveness of each recruitment approach and the best means of encouraging participation. The literature does suggest that ideally phone calls can yield a, a great success rate for recruitment compared to emails where, of course, we, we're dodging things such as the email going to junk mail or the email being deleted or being ignored. Face-to-face -face or in-person strategies can also be successful too. But of course, they're going to entail a higher cost if staff time is, is needed for that. Existing relationships with facilities that cater to early childhood um, needs are also beneficial. And when you have that initial trustworthy relationship and dynamic, it can help you to bolster interest in the research a little more readily. Certainly anecdotally and, and from experience, I know that having a supportive director of an ESEC facility can be very beneficial, particularly when you've got someone who understands the benefits of the research um, and someone who can advocate for the research without being coercive. So these are all considerations in how you determine the best recruitment approach. Ideally, a mix of different strategies, both passive and active, can produce, I think, the greatest recruitment yield and of course, we often encourage that this can be a learning by doing challenge. So it's advisable to look to, to similar studies and see what's been successful by that for them, um, but also paving your own way in terms of what works best for you. In instances where we fall short of an intended sample size, it can of course be necessary to extend the recruitment period or modify the inclusion criteria. But at the end of the day, it is important to consider what will be easiest for your potential participants as well. So everything right down to, can we use a QR code? We all know how to use them now. Is that gonna be the nice, easy way for them to, to tap into and to register for your study? Here, I quickly consider all the necessary steps for the recruitment process in the longitudinal method. So first, of course, we want to identify eligible participants. So for example, if you're looking to include a sample of children with obesity, you might look to the rates of obesity within the, the area or the region that you're targeting. You can also consider whether you'll include siblings in your study, because if not, this will reduce the pool of potential participants. 
So considering all of those different factors right from the outset. Explaining the study for a longitudinal study is, is going to be very critical. So how can you create a unique campaign to motivate parents and children to participate over an extended period? How can you draw attention to the topic of interest and encourage people to want to participate over an extended period of time? And of course, usually that's being targeted towards a caregiver or a parent in the case of working with young children. Obtaining true and informed consent is of course an essential there and maintaining ethical standards, which I'll speak to next. Recruiting an adequate and representative sample is, is also important. Obviously we need to consider, can we generalize to the broader population of interest and is the sample diverse? Particularly when for a longitudinal study, you're, you're using a lot of resources, it, it's very intensive. You want to make sure that that sample is representative. Of course, retention of participants is, is really critical in a longitudinal approach too. And, and there's a lot of suggestions for what works. Um, usually we think towards sort of providing regular updates so that pe people and parents are engaged and they're, they're remembering that it's occurring. Um, even things such as offering group activities, sending Christmas cards, whatever works to make sure that you've got that engagement long-term. And finally, minimizing risk. So including a, a cost benefit, including consideration of cost benefit ratio there. So we would typically ask parents how they heard about the study. Um, and so we can find which recruitment method works the best. Finally, as with any research, it's important to consider ethical issues. So when working with young children, it's important to ensure the child fully understands what they're being asked to do. So understanding that they'll be coming back for, for subsequent visits. Often young children, of course, can be heavily influenced by parents and teachers. And it's worth noting that this can lead to potential negative consequences for rates of participation. For longitudinal product projects in particular, it's important to consider whether content should be secured, consent, pardon me, should, we, should, should be secured at the start of the research project, or whether we consider that at each subsequent visit. Um, generally speaking, a lot of researchers will seek to get that consent every time the child comes in for an assessment or a suite of, um, of assessments. But of course, we do need to weigh that up with lengthy consent forms and, and things of that nature that might, um, you know, discourage people from, from wanting to continue. So having to think about those two sides of the coin. Because longitud longitudinal studies require commitment from the participants for an extended period, it's also important and necessary that researchers communicate the participants' continued ability to withdraw from that study. For young children in particular, situations or events can arise that would require participation to be reconsidered. So you may have a child who is refusing to cooperate or they're just no longer interested in participating, that needs to be considered. And while older children may be capable of making participation decisions when they no longer want to participate in a research study, we need to consider can young children voice their concerns directly? Often we'll see more sort of behaviours such as sleepiness, fussiness, crying, and we need to consider then talking to the caregiver, talking to other researchers to ascertain whether it's appropriate to continue. Again, it's also very important to consider the instruments that we're using to work with young children over time. With context changing, with the children aging, we do need to consider, are there some, some changes needed in order to accurately assess what we're intending to? Finally, three more points. We've got consideration of appointment times. So making sure um, that the appointment times for testing sessions or assessment sessions are suitable for the young child and the family regularly considering whether the young children are habituating to tasks over time and changing those as needed. And also, of course, considering incentives. So while we don't want to come across as coercive, incentives can be a really useful way to have participants remain in a study over time. Thank you so much. I will now pass over to Dr. Sally Statton. Thank you. <laughs> I'll get this up just a second. 
Thank you, Ellie. That's um, a really nice segue, actually. A lot of the things you were talking about, I'm going to talk about too, but maybe in a slightly different way. Um, so before I start, I do also want to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the country that I join um, you from today up here in Brisbane, which is very sunny. It's living up to its name, but still a little chilly. Um, I've got a, I've got a, 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 a definition there too, but mine's from Wikipedia. It's a very sophisticated one, Ellie. <laughs> I think yours was a little bit nicer there. Um, but my background is I'm a developmental psychologist, so we love longitudinal studies. This is like a little bread and butter um, <laughs> type of methodology. Um, and within our team, we use um, longitudinal studies for a range of different things. So obviously we're interested in developmental and educational change across time, whether that be short-term time or really long-term time. Um, including the life course. Um, we're really interested in what predicts and, and correlates with trajectories um, and outcomes for children. Um, we're interested in how uh, what the outcomes are of particular circumstances. So sometimes we're interested in what happens, but also sometimes we're interested in um, what happens under a particular context. So what, what characteristic circumstance or exposure might lead to a particular outcome. Um, also interested in, in the impacts of specific contextual changes so of course a longitudinal study is observational so we're not manipulating it these aren't experimental studies but we do um, we do sometimes have natural experiments that occur or disruptive events so COVID beautiful example of you know a disruptive event that we can then look at what was happening to children before then COVID occurs you know for children in particular areas where there may have been particular types of restrictions um, did children um, or, or were children affected in certain ways and finally what we're you know obviously trying to get to at some point is what are the mechanisms for that so it's all good and fine to describe something something changes we know these things are associated but we also want to explain what might be going on in between those two points um, that make a difference where we can intervene. So we do a lot of longitudinal work within the team I work with up here at the University of Queensland and this is sort of a just a a layout of some of the key data sets um, and the reason I wanted to put these here is because they they vary hugely in size so we've got um, uh, we, we work with the Queensland education data set so this is gives us all of the education data this is administrative data set of all the education data for children attending public schools in Queensland that's from prep all the way through to year 12 and um, at any one time you could have you know, there's 34 million children within that data set because we've been tracking it across time. We also um, are working with the multi-agency multi data integration project, which is um, with the Department of Education at the federal level. And this is an integrated data set where they're using social data, education data, um, and the one we're really interested in, of course, is those who are, who are accessing childcare benefit data um, to look at uh, those accessing early education and care. Now that's going to represent 96% of Australian children depending on what measures you put in, you're looking at about 100,000 children. So these are big representative samples. Administrative data sets are fantastic. And I'm gonna get, look at the differences of these in a second, um, uh, but there are some limitations that I'll, I'll get to that. We also have things like birth cohort studies. I don't know, Dylan, if you're gonna talk about LSAC. LSAC's an example of this. The one we often work with as well is ASPAC. This is a UK based one circa 10,000 kids and then we work our way down to ones there the new longitudinal studies as I'm calling them are ones where we've collected data or been involved in the collection of data and then we also have targeted studies and what I wanted to show you there is when we talk about longitudinal studies we don't always have to be looking at the four million <laughs> we've got and I will give you an example of a longitudinal study that actually just involved two children but was a really important piece of work the other thing we do too um, is we link data so we might have really intensive collections of children at this end um, and then through our partnerships with government agencies particularly we might be able to link with their administrative data and continue to track those children across time or to draw comparison samples for those children so quite a big diversity now as I alluded to depending on what kind of data you draw on whether it's data collected by someone else that's very big um, versus something you might collect yourself, there is always trade-offs in, in what you're going to get from that data. So there's 
often representation if you have really, really big samples, because you literally have everyone if you have an admin data set, or a birth cohort study, you might have, um, you know, a, a very large sample where they've really worked hard to get representation. Um, but of course, the trade-off for these is that we typically are trading off in terms of measurement. Administrative data sets can be very limited in what they have available. You, you, you have no control, it's what's collected. They're extremely messy. Anyone who thinks that getting an admin set given to you makes life easier is under a very false delusion. Um, it can take, you know, six months to a year to just prepare a data set ready to just run, run one analysis. So just, just a, a little bit of credibility or, or, you know, a kudos to those who work with these sorts of data sets because they're not easy. And then as we work our way down, of course, this trade-off changes. So first cohort studies, often we're not collecting these. These are, you know, big multi-million dollar things that are, occur across time, but we can access these sorts of data sets. Um, again, we don't have a lot of choice. Um, the other thing you have to remember about these studies is often by their nature, the data was collected a long time ago. So something like LSAC, the data on children and their early childhood experiences are now 20 years old. And so we have to be really thoughtful of does it, is it still relevant in the policy context, for example, that we're working on? And so that's the trade-off. But then we also can see what happened to those children 20 years on. So that's quite nice in that regard. In terms of these sort of what I'm calling newer longitudinal studies, these are really just the ones we've, you know, collected ourselves. And obviously there's lots of examples of that. Nelly was talking about the ones you've been doing there at Early Start. Um, these you know, the ones we've worked on can vary in size, again, depending on our funding. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you, I guess, specifically about today is really about some things around sampling that I think is really important in the longitudinal context. I actually think it's important in any research data collection that you do. Um, but the reason it really matters here is that, as Ellie alluded to, longitudinal studies can be costly. They're very slow and laborious to get started. You see, I do have a cold. And they're really, really effortful. They take a lot of work. Um, and so you want to make sure that when you start out collecting data, that you're giving yourself your best chance possible of making that data as meaningful as possible and as useful as possible to yourself, as well as potentially other things that you want to do with it. Um, and I'm going to really talk about this idea that design matters. Um, and, and I've put that against the target of studies. And these are ones where I want to give you an example of way that you can, ways that you can and that we've potentially used um, really specific design approaches to how we sample data so that we don't need the big numbers because by design we are targeting down to what we really want to look at or allowing ourselves to have some sort of comparison group. Right. Lisa, jump in if I start to go too long. <laughs> um, so here, for me, this is really about the art and the importance of sampling. And there's always this balance. There's a feasibility, accessibility, and Ellie was talking about that. You know, how are you going to actually recruit the families? Always trading against the representation and design. You know, it's really easy to get your friend to fill out a survey. Is that your target of what you want to be actually getting from your data collection? And as I said, longitudinal studies or any study, um, these are good considerations. So I'm going to just bombard you with a bunch of examples, and I apologise. Hopefully you'll get the key point <laughs> by the end of it. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the big ones. I'm not going to talk about administrative data and birth cohort data. They, they deal with them themselves. These are the ones where we've had to deal with the questions of how we're going to sample. Um, so the first one I'm going to give you is E for Kids. E for Kids was a um, five-year longitudinal study. I was involved in the sort of setting up component of this many, many years ago um, as a you know, prior PhD <laughs> as a research assistant. Um, and this study was recruiting uh, two and a half thousand children from across Queensland and Victoria. It was funded by several, it was an ARC, it was funded by several bodies. So there was a fair bit of money involved in this one um, and lots of people. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is just uh, in terms of this, the really important thing about this particular study is what our goal was. And our goal here, not like, like unlike LSAC or ALSAC, was not to get a representation of the entire Australian population, but was to get a representation of a sample of Australian preschool age children attending ECUC services. And so there were three things that, that had to happen in terms of the sampling that we needed to think about children that were living in metro, rural and remote Australian um, communities. We also then had to what we call stratify. So we had to think about um, all of and, and document all of the long daycare 
kindergarten, family daycare, occasional care, and we also had no program control. So we did have a control group of kids not attending any kind of program, and that's very complicated, and you can ask me about that later and how they did that. Um, but it was to get that representation. And, of course, we wanted community SES. So here we ended up in 140 ECEC settings. We targeted through their services, um, but we made sure that we had a mixture based on the population of those in those different locations and those in those different areas. And so from that, we're able to, as best as possible, create what we what Ellie was referring to, which is a representative sample of the population we were interested in. So that's just one example there. Um, that's the one we've also linked to the Department of Education. So we're tracking them through to you know, uh, or end of high school now. Um, another example is one that's being set up at the moment. So this is as um, Dylan and Lisa are part of the, the Centre of Excellence for the Digital Child. Um, and this is the sampling, uh, proposed sampling for their longitudinal study. So this is going to be a study of 3,000 children. And here what they're looking for is an actual representat representative sample of families of children um, from birth to eight years. Um, and so the things that they're considering when they're when they're targeting communities to actually recruit families is having a look at what, what's the region and in fact what's the population that we would expect in that region because that will tell us how many families we should be getting in order to have a representative sample. Um, we have specific states that we're working in and then what we're also looking for is development of vulnerability. So one of the key sources we often look at when we're trying to target particular samples is we're looking at the AEDC, so the Australian Early Development Census. And from that, we can actually look at particular communities and it will tell us the number or the proportion of vulnerable children in that community. And so we can then target those communities for recruitment and know that we've got a better chance to make sure that we have either that variability or the particular group that we're looking for. Um, this is what it ends up looking like as a big <laughs> fancy thing. Don't be intimidated by that. It's just a bunch of boxes. But it just to show you that you're sort of mapping it out and then we know exactly how many of each of those particular strata, as we call it, um, that we're looking for based on the population. So it gets quite complicated in these levels, but in a lot of simple terms, it's really just looking at who, which areas have these characteristics and that's where we're going to target and, and invest our time doing, you know, the, the, the going out and meeting with people, the newsletters, the Facebook local sites, etc. Um, STARS is another example where we use the AEDC as well. We quite like using this because we like working with the young children. We think it's a really good way of, of, of capturing um, developmental vulnerability. STARS is a bit of an interesting one because we um, STARS is a, a study of sleep development. As part of that, we actually have environmental sensors that we put in each child's bedroom. <laughs> um, and one of the really interesting things about Brisbane, if you don't know Brisbane, the city's here, coast is there, the inland's here, this is urban fringe sort of area. Um, there can be up to, you know, five or 10 degree difference in temperature um, in, on a summer's day between those two locations. And so because we're measuring temperature in children's bedroom, we wanted to make sure we had um, variability. So we were interested here in terms of geographic location. So how, you know, how populated are the areas from central all the way through to an urban fringe region. But we also needed to capture coast versus inland because we know there's massive temperature differences for the environments children are in. And then again, we also wanted to ensure that we had this developmental vulnerability. So what we can do is go down to these mappings on the AEDC and depending on the colour shading here, that tells you how many children there are with developmental vulnerabilities in those communities. So it gives you some differences um, in areas that you can recruit from. Again, we always have a bit of a nice map. One of the things we did as part of this because of this environment centers, census is because we know what we're looking for in terms of that distribution, we can then monitor as we're recruiting. So as we're recruiting and giving out these census, we can actually check are we getting enough of them across each of the groups that we think. Um, and then we can obviously adjust if we need to get more in one community, literally on in the process of recruitment, we can um, redirect some of our attention to particular areas where we know we, we haven't yet recruited enough children. Um, another example of using this AEDC, and this is not a longitudinal study, but I think it's a really nice example, is one that we've just recently done, which was around looking at meal provision and practices in ECEC, particularly in low income communities where there's high um, food insecurity. Um, and what we were looking for, our goal here was a sample of ECEC centres 
in development of Roma communities that did and did not provide food. And so the way we, we did this is we, we already had a target low income community. So this is Logan in Brisbane, where we know there's a, um, a you know, a, a, a lot of um, variation, but a lot of low income families. Within that, we looked specifically at locations where there was high development of vulnerability, because it's not a, it's not a strict rule that you will have high development of vulnerability just because you have low income. So we're looking at that. And actually, the ADC is really clever because you, all these dots here is it will literally tell you the long daycares, the kindergartens within that area. So you can go down and actually look them up. And then we use the Child Care Finder, which is a government website, to actually look and do a screening of what the food provision was for those services. And from that, we were able to identify the two. Now, what was really interesting in this case is that we ended up backtracking this and ended up we, we started in just Logan, but we found that we could um, only identify a very small number of low income communities where food was being provided for children in their ch uh, early childhood service. And so we ended up using this to actually do a whole piece of work around the whole of Queensland. We mapped it back out again and found that there was a, that, that we actually have um, sort of uh, uh, inequity that's occurring across and we've got a paper about to come out about that where children who are at most need of um, who are most at risk of food insecurity are least likely to be provided food in their early childhood services so that sort of sparked a different question there um, so I'm just going to come down to this sort of last example and this is the one I, I think I've got one more but this is the one I wanted to talk to you about of a, a case study of two children so this was in Mount Isa um, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's a thousand kilometres from anywhere. It's an inland city, a mining city, um, where a number of years ago we were doing, um, we were asked to come in and do evaluation work of the town camp um, and the families within the town camp um, in Mount Isa and a program that was being run to get those children into school. So it's a breakfast program and a, and a school bus program. Um, and within that, we ended up doing a longitudinal study of two boys um, within that, that group. So we had a a group of 15 kids who had never attended school before that were living in the town camp of all different ages. And these children were then, um, we were tracking them, we tracked them for two years, and then we had two boys that we continued to track for another two years. And again, the point I wanted to make here is that whilst the sample was really small, we were really thoughtful about which of the two children we were selecting. So what we wanted to be able to do was understand some of the different contextual factors that might have um, in um, modified their trajectories of these two, two young children. So they were both the same age. They came from the same community. Uh, they were both males, um, but their baseline information that we collected when we tested them right at the beginning, one of them was tracking really, really well. The other was tracking really, really poorly. And so we tracked these four boys really intensively for four years. So including a lot of qualitative work to really understand what was happening for those boys alongside their data that we were collecting using standard measures and where there were changes in their trajectories, we could look and, and interview people about what was going on for those children at that time. So it was really in-depth longitudinal study, but only of a sample of two. So I just want to make that point that we don't have to have 10,000 children to do really important work. Um, this is one more example. I'm not going to do that because in the interest of time, but come back if you want to know about how we do twin studies in this space. Oh, she said I had two more minutes. It's all right. I'll pass on to Dylan. I can come back to twins if someone asks me a question. Okay, thank you. Um, Lisa, you can see my screen okay, so We're all good. Um, and thank you very much, Sally, for um, your presentation and Ellie before that. Uh, my turn now. Um, and what I'm going to um, present today is that I'm going to go back and touch on some of those different types of questions um, that Sally mentioned at the start of her presentation. So different ways we can use longitudinal research to answer different questions. And I'm going to provide some examples, particularly from PhD students and postdocs at early start where I work to bring some of those to life. So Sally already mentioned most of these, so I won't spend too long on them. Longitudinal research um, can show us 
trends or patterns or traje trajectories of an outcome that we're interested in. So that's one advantage of using this type of research. We can also use longitudinal methods to um, understand the determinants or the predictors of our outcome of interest. And we might want to target these in interventions. Um, as Sally mentioned, we can understand if there's any benefits, uh, developmental or health benefits of an outcome that we're interested in. In, the, in that case, we might call it an exposure. Uh, we can also use longitudinal methods to get at these kind of chicken or egg questions. So which came first, um, X or Y? And so we might be looking at the timing of the associations or temporal associations or even if there's bi-directional associations, if two things influence each other during child development. We can't get to these questions using other methods like cross-sectional research. Now, um, Sally also mentioned how we can use longitudinal research with qualitative methods. So although we focus mostly here on quantitative methods, uh, I want everyone to remember that we could be using qualitative methods with, uh, with our longitudinal research. So that's great. And my list here is just some examples. And there are other questions, other ways we can use longitudinal research. So this is not an exhaustive list. OK, so the first studies I'll focus on um, look at trends and determinants. OK, so this research was by uh, our PhD student, uh, now Dr Byron Kemp. Now, Byron was really interested in looking at changes in physical activity as children transition into adolescence from um, late primary school to high school. And Byron used um, the longitudinal study of Australian children to investigate um, this area. Sally, Sally already mentioned that that's a, a large representative sample of Australian children. It's a great resource. Um, so Byron was able to kind of um, look into this question that we knew from the literature, we all tend to get a little bit less active as we transition from primary school to high school into adolescence. But what Byron was able to show is in, in Australian data was that most of that change in total physical activity that we see here actually came from a decline in non-organised physical activity. That's non-structured physical activity, the type of activity we do with our friends for fun, and for play after school. He then uh, went a little bit further, delved into this question a little bit further. And what he saw was within that area of non-organized physical activity, um, a lot of the difference, the change over time could be explained by a decline in active play. Things like playing in the playground with your friends, playing tips and tag, and these types of games, rather than just, for example, non-organized ball sports that kids might involve in as well. Um, so this got Byron thinking about, you know, what, how might we keep kids active as they transition into adolescence and might active play be one area to target? Byron went on to look at the factors that might predict um, maintaining participation in non-organized physical activity during this transition. And these were his factors that he found predicted or determined um, participation. And so what it tells us was that if we wanted to develop interventions in this year, area, we might actually target females who were less likely to participate in physical activity. We might develop tailored interventions, I should say, um, particularly for those young people who didn't enjoy physical activity, um, maybe those who had less siblings in their household and those that were tending to engage in home computer use and technologies, maybe rather than being active. Um, this is another type of study in this same area. This was conducted by um, Associate Professor Stuart Vella when he was a postdoc working with us. Stuart also used the longitudinal study of Australian children, and he was interested in um, trajectories of children's health-related quality of life. Health-related quality of life is a, a general measure, a psychosocial measure of children's kind of health and well-being. Being. And in this case, it's reported by their parents in LSAC. Down the bottom here, we're looking at ages from four to 12 years of age. 
And Stuart was able to use a kind of clustering analysis that predicted trajectories in this outcome. So the good news was that 85% of children in Australia were in this kind of healthy area where their health related quality of life was high and it stayed high throughout childhood. Um, but for example, uh, there was somewhere around 8% of children um, in this more negative um, trajectory where they started high, but they dropped off over time. A small percentage of children, one and a half percent improved over time. And then there was another group around about 5% that rebounded. So really we could see here that around about 8% of children we might be worried about because they'll drop out over time. And so he then looked on to see what might predict um, being in the healthy group versus the other groups. And he found that kind of these three factors were important. The first three are really related to socioeconomic status. And so they're not very surprising that we might need support for children in disadvantaged areas to maintain their health related quality of life. Um, the fourth one was around non-participation in organized sports. And, and so this is maybe a modifiable factor, a factor we could target to support children's health related quality of life. And um, anyone at the University of Wollongong will know Stuart now as, as an expert in sports and children's sports. The next group of studies are about outcomes or developmental benefits. And this research was by um, Dr. Jay Burley when she was a PhD student. And this was on my ARC DECRA pro project, the PATH ABC project. Um, from this data set, Jade was interested in associations between children's use of electronic media and their later cognitive, social and emotional development. So as part of this study, um, Jade collected data at two time points. Um, and so she collected data on children's digital media use, including um, things like their program viewing, which we would call passive electronic media use, um, cognitively passive, we might say, versus um, their engagement with electronic apps and e-games, which might be more cognitively um, interactive. Um, she also collected data at two time points on their cognitive de development and their social emotional development. And what we found was um, children that were spending less time viewing programs tended to have better social and emotional development 12 months later when we followed them up. Um, likewise, children who used apps and electronic games at kind of moderate levels at around 30 minutes or less per day had better inhibition or a measure of self-control um, than those children who are using apps and games at higher levels, at more than 30 minutes per day. Because this, this is one way we can use longitudinal research to look at changes over time and how um, we might see changes in children's development. Now, this one wasn't from early start. This is a really a seminal study conducted in New Zealand, the Dunedin Longitudinal Study, where they followed um, children over many, many years from birth um, until adulthood. And this was in the area of kind of um, developmental psychology. This is a really seminal study that looked at children's early self-regulation. So their ability to control their social uh, interactions, their behavioral um, reactions and their emotions, um, despite impulses and distractions. So um, they looked at childhood self-regulation -reg during the early years and lots of outcomes later on in adulthood. What they found was um, childhood self-regulation was associated with adult health, health with um, income in adulthood and um, uh, employment in adulthood, as well as um, cr criminal convictions in adulthood as well. Importantly, what they showed was um, children whose self-regulation improved during the early years had better outcomes later on um, than those children whose self-regulation didn't um, change or didn't improve, didn't start low. And so this really put kind of self-regulation on the map. This was seminal work that showed us that we might want to 
develop strategies to improve young children's self-regulation to improve their outcomes in adulthood. Okay, um, our next type of research was research that looked at these bi-directional associations, the kind of chicken or egg questions we might have. Um, this study was by Devin Anzac, Dr. Devin Anzac. Devin is now a postdoctoral research fellow on my ARC discovery project. This is his PhD work conducted at ACU. And Devin was interested in looking at the associations between children's physical activity levels and their nighttime sleep patterns. And this research um, is actually looking at day-to-day -day patterns over time. So this is a little bit of a different design, a really quite an interesting design to look at day-to-day um, -day associations during a longitudinal study. What did he find? Well, he did actually find the associations that he hypothesized. So physical activity during the day, high levels of physical activity were associated with longer duration of sleep at nighttime in children. And the reverse was true too. Um, more sleep at nighttime also was associated with a little, little bit more physical activity during the day as well. Um, and so this was one of the kind of first studies, I think, to look at these associations, particularly using objective measures. Another type of chicken or egg question. So this is one study that, um, that I conducted where we were interested in looking at the connection between children's electronic media use and their self-regulation during early childhood. And we were wondering, does one come before the other? Can we get to um, these questions? For this data, we use the longitudinal study of Australian children again, as we've used several times. And we did find that early media use was associated with later self-regulation and that self-regulation was then associated with later media use as well. Although the associations weren't particularly strong in this study. Okay, so those are just some examples. Um, and I'm gonna finish off then with us thinking about or summarizing some of the benefits and some of the challenges we've discussed about longitudinal research. So one of the main reasons we might use longitudinal research, say compared to cross-sectional research, is that it'll provide stronger evidence of cause and effect. Um, I think as we've seen from the examples, uh, longitudinal research can help us to identify stages in life that might be sensitive for us to target any intervention, and even the types of things, the types of mechanisms we might target to elicit better, better outcomes for young children at the right time of their life. Um, it might be easier to collect observational data in some cases, uh, rather than conducting uh, a, an experimental study where we might have to implement an intervention and elicit change. Sometimes we might consider that to be more difficult. So the longitudinal research might be considered easier. Um, we've also got a certain amount of flexibility with the longitudinal study. We might actually be able to use the data and go back and look at different questions that we hadn't thought about before. Um, and we might be able to be a bit flexible then with how we're conducting our research. Um, but I think you've heard there's many um, challenges that we need to consider. Um, at the top there, we've got the need to um, establish maybe a representative sample if we really want to generalize from our longitudinal study. And um, Sally showed us the sophisticated ways we might need to go about doing that. Um, related to that is um, retention and loss to follow up are, are critical issues. And so if we obtain our representative sample, we need to retain that representative sample. And who are we most likely to lose in our longitudinal study? The participants we need to hold on to to the most. So those participants from disadvantaged backgrounds and from disadvantaged families. So we might need particular strategies to retain those participants. We might even need to oversample from a minority areas to make sure we keep them in our sample. Um, we mentioned that there can be a long wait from longitudinal research from the results to be able to then have be translated into society and have an impact on society. And that's our real goal. So these 30 year longitudinal studies can take a long time to have an impact. Um, we mentioned that uh, there's de developmental changes, particularly during childhood, these can be rapid and this might affect how we can measure things in our longitudinal study. Often we don't wanna change measures, but um, if it, we might have an infant that's one or less, 
up to a preschooler and measuring language or literacy development might be really different at these different stages. Uh, purists would tell us that longitudinal studies are still not ideal for establishing cause and effect. We really might need an experiment to do that. So there's still limitations here. And to conduct these large and longitudinal studies, it can be very, very expensive and difficult for us to do on our own. Um, thank you, Lisa. I will stop there and uh, open it up for questions and discussion on these issues. What an amazing session. Thank you so much, Ellie, Sally and Dylan. Um, you've given us so much to think about. Now, I know that there's a number of people on online now and um, who will be viewing it later that are thinking around doing a longitudinal study themselves. I just wonder if each of you could give us um, a top tip, a piece of advice um, for somebody starting out thinking about longitudinal. So Ellie, how about we start with you? Sure, thanks Lisa. Look, I think for me, um, and particularly reflecting on the discovery space longitudinal study that we finished recently, it's really taking into account the retention and, and trying to limit attrition. So for me, that was really being very thoughtful about how we put together the, the data collection processes and assessments that we used and making it an enjoyable experience for children, for families, not just enjoyable, but I suppose something that's worth their time and also something that's convenient for them. So being able to do it at a time that suits them um, and making sure that, you know, there's no kind of feeling of failure or, you know, it, it's simply observational. It's gathering information. It's seeing how you do and it's us showing a genuine interest in them. So that would then entail, we, we had plenty of follow-up and things like that to, to make sure that they felt valued. Um, and that really helped us with retention. Great, thanks, Al. Um, Sally, what's your advice? I'm going to stay on theme here and say think about your design because I think sometimes we make the assumption you get lots more people and it gets for a better study. I, my argument is, and I think what plays out is good design means you don't need to get quite as many people. And I think that is always the thing you're dealing with, particularly in longitudinal studies where you, you do by default have to account for a lot of the contextual things that um, children and families particularly are, uh, what, what, how they're living their lives. And so um, if you can think about clever ways of designing studies, recruiting samples and thinking about who your sample are, you might actually, um, it's a little bit more work and it's a lot more thought, but it might actually lead to a much stronger study for you and also mean you don't need as many numbers if you don't have, you know, lots of money and lots of people around you to help you with your data collection. So just be clever. Does that, is that a good answer? Be clever. <laughs> think just think really answer. carefully. <laughs> Thank you. And I really appreciated your example with two participants as well, um, looking at that sort of longitudinal design alongside the 10,000. That was really, really interesting. Dylan, your advice? Um, sorry, I'm going to repeat retention that Ellie already said, but say that um, in addition to the things Ellie said, um, think about how you can, well, first, your participants are so special to you. They're so important. So how can you show that they're so special to you? So things like birthday cards, as their birthdays come around during your longitudinal study, can really show that, um, you know, they're, they're meaningful to you and the relationship's really meaningful, but also making them feel like they're so part of something special. It's part of something and they're all members of this really special thing that's going on. And so, for example, if it was a longitudinal study of children in the Illawarra, then they can, can talk about how in, important that is to be part of that, you know, growing up in the Illawarra type longitudinal study, that kind of thing. So, um, Show, show them they're special to you and make them be part of something special. Know that they're part of something special. Yeah. Great advice. Um, you've given us such good messages around time, the time in longitudinal studies to collect and to work with the participants and to keep going, but just how valuable uh, that snapshot of that particular period of time is, is for research um, more generally. So thank you very much. And we're getting lots of affirmation as well coming through. Um, Shirley says, thank you very much for a very engaging and informative session. And I think that's a really, a really lovely way to finish. So thank you. Um, um, Ellie and Sally and Dylan for such a wonderful session and for those of you who um, who want to revisit this session please know that it will be shared on our Early Start YouTube channel very soon um, so watch out for that 
and uh, a date for your diary coming up. Um, you can also hopefully see that. Um, our next session is scheduled for the 6th of September. You can watch it live on um, at 12 p.m. and we're looking at planning for impact with research projects and we'll be welcoming Leah Sherwood from our research office here at UOW, Kate Highfield from ACU and also works for Early Childhood Australia and uh, Shirley Agostino from the School of Education. So thank you everybody, uh, really lovely to see you all and um, looking forward to continued conversations. Thanks Lisa, thanks everyone.